Eve, but still, Merry Christmas. We won't be gathering together tomorrow, so I would love uh, to be able to say as many times as I can. Merry Christmas. This is what we've been waiting for. Merry Christmas. <laughs> this is what we've been waiting for. Advent is a time of waiting for arrival. And the beautiful thing about a calendar is that we know that the days are ahead of us, that they, that they are here, that they will come. So I hope that as you are waiting for other things in your life that don't have quite as clear as a calendar, as what we've been counting on the days to December, that you see and experience how we can trust God's promises. So in the ways that you're waiting, God will arrive. Uh, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Uh, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing together. Uh, we'll start with um, singing over the rest of the morning, but first, uh, let me pray. God, thank you that we can gather this morning. Thank you for um, inviting us into this space, for preparing this space for us. I ask that as we're together, that we experience your peace, and your joy, and your presence, that you are here, even now. Um, Holy Spirit, I ask that we experience your presence.
name is Hannah. I am the Connection Coordinator here at Bethany West Seattle. It's so good to be with all of you this morning. And today, I get to bring you good news of great joy for all people. Our pancake breakfast is next week. And that will be on New Year's Eve. Uh, and so all your New Year's resolutions about carbs can wait until 2024. Uh, new Year, new us, right? So if you are new with us, uh, we just want to extend a really special welcome. Thank you for joining us um, and taking a risk and being here with us this Christmas Eve. Um, our mission is to invite you to God, community, and wholeness. And so we hope that wherever you are in your faith journey, whatever your experience with church has been, uh, you have a great day today, and we uh, just want to really warm you warmly welcome you. To that end, you'll see a Connect card in the pew in front of you. It looks like this. It's our way of getting to know you. Um, and so if you want to submit a prayer request or ask any questions, please don't be shy. Uh, there's also a nursery in the back for any kids or adults that may um, need a little extra wiggle room. And I'll also warn you that the connection question is coming up. So for those of us with social anxiety room, bathrooms are just out the doors to the right. Um, so if you are visiting with us, we want to just give you full permission to receive your presence here as such a gift. Um, but if you do call Bethany home, this is our moment where uh, we consider giving back to God um, just some of the blessings that he has given to us. So this is a moment um, where we can receive tithes and offerings. There is a QR code on the screen. There's also paper envelopes in the back. Uh, would you pray with me for this giving moment? Uh, God, we celebrate today the gift of your son. We thank you for giving us your spirit, your joy, your peace. We pray you will shape us in your character so we take this moment to reflect and give you back our best. We love you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. So now I'm going to invite the kids to the back aisle where you won't be leaving. You'll just be coming up on the stage for a special song and story. Um, so if you want to congregate back in the aisle, teacher Megan will be there momentarily. There we go. Um, so kiddos are welcome to join in the aisle, and the rest of us will stand, and our connection question for the day is, what is your favorite holiday activity that you find the most restful?
All right, church family. I hate to interrupt these awesome conversations. We're going to have some extended greeting time at the end. Um, before the kids come in, grown-ups, you are going to need to be able to make a barnyard animal sound during this song. Can I hear your best? Barnyard animal sound on three. One, two, three. Uh, I think it could probably be a little bit louder. One, two, three. Nice. This song is about the special night when Jesus was born. And there were some people there, but there were also some animals. So we are going to need some help definitely from the kids and also from the grown-ups to sing the song, Oh, What Special Night. Christmas. And 
starts off with Christmas is red. Do we agree with that? We think Christmas is red? It's a shiny new sled. It's candy canes. It's four toy store lanes. It sprinkles on sweet bread. It's packages with bows and Rudolph's bright red nose. It's pictures drawn and dressed up lawns. It's warm mittens when it snows. You guys see all these examples of red? It's the drummer boy's drum. It's power pa bum bum. It's Santa Claus and cranberry sauce. It's apples, pecans, and plums. It's presents that we send to family and friends. It's jolly cards and merry hearts. Yep, Christmas is red. I agree. Christmas is green, all you green lovers out there. It's an evergreen scene. It's holly, it's mistletoe twigs, it's emerald lights a gleam. It's garlands on rails and pine needle trails. It's winter boots and funny elf suits. It's that old Mr. Grinch tail. Can I see it? Can you see it? There we go. Oh. I don't know. I don't see Mr. Grinch on that one. We'll have to watch that one later. It's Granny Smith pies. It's plaid bow ties. It's fresh potpourri that smells Christmassy. It's stockings hung high and tinsel on trees. It's grass iced by freeze, just like this morning. Yep, it's Christmas tree balls and artwork on walls. I think Christmas is green. <gasps> Christmas is white. It's warm candlelight. Did anybody get a candle when they came in today? Yeah, oh great. It's mountain tops and small fancy shops. It's turtle doves in flight. It's December snowstorms and blankets so warm. It's angel wings and the songs that we sing about our dreams for Christmas morn. Did you guys know tomorrow is Christmas morning? Okay, good, good. You guys are ready. It's Christmas Eve, so tomorrow's Christmas morning. Yeah. It's sleigh rides through snow and tea lights that glow. It's North Pole, t North Pole tails and frosty exhales. It's most definitely cocoa with marshmallows, right, Theo? It's a star shining bright on the holiest of nights. It's powdered cake and paper snowflakes. Yes, Christmas is white. Christmas is brown. It's pine cones scattered all around. It's caramel corn and copper French horns. It's winter's frozen ground. It's firewood piled high and reindeers that fly. Anybody seen a flying reindeer today? Oh, pretty cool. It's cinnamon sweets. Yeah, cinnamon sweets and gingerbread treats. It's homemade pecan pie. It's a cradle soft with hay and a donkey's gentle bray. What's that donkey sound again? Hee haw, hee haw. It's God within a baby skin on that very first Christmas day. You see over there? It's shepherds kneeling down and wise ones gathered all around. It's Mary's sigh and Jesus' cry. Yes, Christmas is brown. Christmas is you. It's your unique you. It's your wondrous gleam, your bedtime dreams. You color each Christmas anew. Each one of you. It's your tinsel and flair and gifts that you share. It's your jingling smile and your fa-la-la -la style. It's how you love and how you care. Can everybody say fa-la-la-la? la, -la, -la? la, -la, -la. Fa -la, -la, -la. Nice job. It's songs that you sing and the light that you bring. It's your heartfelt compassion and your hope put in action. It's your thrill for all the little things. It's your love for what's true. It's the good that you do. You're part of the story, the joy, and the glory. Yes, Christmas is you, each one of you. Well, you guys, thank you so much for reading this story with me today and being a part of Christmas. Could, could we all wish each other a Merry Christmas? Merry Christmas. Well, great. Go ahead, you guys, if you want to make your way back to your parents. And then afterwards, we've got some cookie making to do after service. Good ASAP. Can we get a round of applause for these kids that did such a great job? And we've got a couple kids that are going to stick around and help us with our next portion of service. Mr. Woods is going to help light our fourth Christmas candle, and his parents are going to help him. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. 
Authority rests upon his shoulders, and his name, he is named a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord hosts will do this. Luke 1, 78 through 79. Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of purpose. here at Bethany West Seattle. Uh, welcome this morning. If you're joining us online, I know we have a faithful crew there and um, we're really happy to have you as well. If you want to go ahead, if you're at home, grab a candle because at the end of this service, we're going to have a moment where we light candles together. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, so for the next few moments, we have the gift uh, of pausing this Christmas and reflecting on a word. It's really a reality that is central to this season. And I think we'll all agree, regardless of kind of where we come from or what brought us here this morning, if we want to be here or not, we'll all agree uh, that this word is sort of central to our human experience. It's a word that speaks to all of us in some way. And I'd be willing to bet it gets at a longing that each of us share. And the word we're going to talk about this morning is peace. Peace that inhabits our body and calms our anxious thoughts. Peace that defines our relationships, even those we admit feel in the moment sort of out beyond repair, but we long for a different way of relating. Peace that, dare we say, is even political. A peace that, as the great poet Maya Angelou articulate, articulates so beautifully in her Christmas poem, is a peace that's louder than the explosions of bombs. And we bring that longing to the Christmas story of old, a story that can seem almost, you know, fairy tale-ish, certainly insignificant given the world we occupy. A virgin birth, the sky aligning in these mysterious ways, angels filling that sky and announcing that birth. What is happening? This is wild stuff. Of course, it's natural given our modern sensibilities that all of that would lead us to ask, especially given we live in 2023, what's happening here? Why does this matter for us? We live in an age where achievements of the human mind are many and endless. We literally have the world at our fingertips through the technologies that we have. We have a good friend who's uh, working on creating a quantum computer. Over breakfast recently, he attempted to explain to me what exactly that means. And I would love to share it with you all as well, but the truth is I still have no idea. This was like an hour-long conversation, right? Recent years have introduced us to wonders, things like Bitcoin and virtual reality. Chat GTP has become a regular part of our vernacular in the past year. We've been ushered into this new era, this new frontier that is artificial intelligence. And all of that is good and well. All of this has great potential to bring about change for the better in our world. And yet, the reality is, most of us would observe that even in this world brimming with advancements and technological possibility, it's brought us no closer to that desire we have to know peace. To know peace in us, to know peace around us. And it's that very longing that brings us not into the future, but actually back to this little story from long ago, a story about a family with no power or privilege to speak of, a family who couldn't find a place to stay, to abide, to shelter, 
Even in their greatest hour of need, they were relegated to be with the animals in the back stable. I won't have you name the animal sound again. A story about shepherds, right? Bottom of the pecking order to be sure, out in the field, not hoping for much, not expecting anything on this particular night, just sort of faithfully going about their work, trying to get by. A story about a baby. Yes, a baby born of a virgin, but don't get too caught up on that detail for now. A baby whose very existence into the world was announced with a word attached to his name since well before that birth. Peace. Peace. The old prophet Isaiah, 700 years before, said he will be called the Prince of Peace. The old priest Zachariah, better known as the father of John the Baptist, announced that this baby who was coming would light the way, guide our feet in the path of peace. The angels would announce his birth, lighting up the sky with the words, peace among you. Now if we give these ancient voices, just for a moment, the benefit of the doubt, if we trust for a moment they hold truth, the sensible next question is how? How? How does such peace find its way into my soul, into my story? How does such peace inform the community of which I'm a part of and the weary world in which we live? How? Our Advent season has been guided this year by the words from Isaiah chapter 9, a chapter that begins with these words. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. These words are directed towards a people who have been surrounded on every side uh, by the military superpower of that day, Assyria. Their peace is being threatened. Over the past several centuries, rabbis have gathered to discuss this book of Isaiah, and over time, rabbinical tradition has determined the most accurate way to translate that phrase, deep darkness, is to speak of it in terms of the circles a person develops around their eyes when they're not sleeping well. And this makes sense. When your way of life is threatened, when you are not at peace, sleep is hard. I think many of us have been there. We know what this deep darkness is like. In fact, I, I just read an article recently that talked about the growing problem of sleep deprivation. Saying sleep problem rose from about 36% of people saying they struggled with sleep before the pandemic uh, to now 50 per, over 50% of folks saying they have trouble sleeping after the pandemic. And these numbers are worse for, you know, teenagers. They said three out of four students in the U.S. in grades 9 through 12 self-report struggles when it comes to sleep. Sometimes sleeping too much, but more often not being able to sleep, to rest, even when they want to. Real rest is hard in our world, and the reasons for this are, are many and varied. But I know for me personally, the times when I've struggled to sleep, uh, it's about a lack of peace. It's real worries and it kind of play over and over in my head around my kids and, and their future, the world they'll grow up in. It's images of refugees in Gaza and the war in Ukraine. It's, it's dread over another election approaching in the coming year. Some of chapters after Isaiah names the deep darkness, the circles around the eyes that folks are living with and living in, we see this distress has turned so great that they turn to the neighboring nation. They turn to Egypt for help. And again, through the prophet Isaiah, God speaks these outrageously counterintuitive words to a group of people longing for peace. Here's what he says. He says, in returning and in rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. See, the heart of God's message here is this. Look, you don't need the strength of the Egyptian army to come to your aid. You actually need a peace that runs deeper than these circumstances. You need a peace that comes not through your outstriving or outsmarting or outpowering or outmaneuvering your enemy, your aggressor, but a peace that comes from deep and real rest in me, in, in, in the loving God. What a wild thing to say to someone in real acute distress. We all know you don't need rest in the darkness. You need fight. You need, you know, survival instincts. You need to power through. Actually, the counterintuitive word of the gospel is no. You need rest. When I was a, a kid or I was 10 years old or 
or so, my dad started a new job and it required him to travel for a bit for work and I didn't like this, mostly because I was a bit anxious as a kid and I was sure while he was sort of out and about on planes and traveling that something bad would happen to him, right? And his travels would often bring him home late in the evening and my bedroom actually abutted um, the house we used to live in where uh, the laundry room and uh, the door to the back entrance of the house is in the laundry room so that he would park his car in the garage and come in through that door and it was a weirdly loud door like it made this suction sound when you would open it and so I could hear when the door would open and I remember as a kid just lying in bed like late into the night waiting to hear the laundry room door open and shut waiting for the assurance that everyone was home, right? That my dad had made it, that we were all okay, and I could finally fall asleep, right? I could rest. See, in a way, the whole of Scripture up to this point in the book of Isaiah is a story about a God who in love created the world. And then in a, a turn of events, humankind exploited that love. The peace was disrupted. Instead of resting in that love, he began fighting and posturing, lying and asserting power over instead of living in peace. We began making decisions about whose life held more value and whose life held less. And then comes Christmas. This moment where we pause and consider Emmanuel, God with us. See, Christmas is this reminder that we have such a secure love that the same God who beckoned Judah through the prophet Isaiah saying, return to me and rest did not give up on humankind when they actually neglected to heed that message. Christmas is a reminder that when we could not find our way to rest in God, God in great love came to us and said, here I am, look, you don't have to live in deep darkness. There is dawn coming, daylight breaking. In the book of Matthew, which is one of, Matthew, one of the books about Jesus' life, there's this terribly important moment where Jesus reveals his identity to the people listening. He reveals that he is actually one with the God of all creation. And in that moment, he immediately invites his listeners to live in a different reality. He says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We hear those words, and it's like, man, I just, we let out a collective sigh of sorts. It's like the whole world was waiting to hear that laundry room door open and shut, waiting to hear the assurance, everyone's home, you're okay, you're loved, now rest. And when we slow and rest in that great love, we find that there's this sort of returning to our truest self that happens. We have young kids, and they're utterly wonderful small people. We love them, we like them. We enjoy just sort of spending time with them. They're creative, they're fun, they're thoughtful. And all that is good and true until they lack sleep, right? <laughs> and to be clear, we love them still, mostly, yes. But our enjoyment of them takes a real hit, you know? <laughs> and the meltdowns start, the whining will start. And it's at this point that Sam and I will look at each other, Sam's my husband, and say, you know, they're just really not themselves. Maybe we need an R-E-S-T. Right? Um, this is our sort of cryptic way of um, communicating. And our son, who's our oldest son, who's learning to read, recently responded to our cryptic communication yes. saying, um, Yeah, right. And oh. <laughs> so cool. So it's a new day around here. But there's something about rest, and specifically rest in the security of God's love, that brings us back to ourselves. Right? Again, the great Maya Angelou in that same peace poem, she articulates this so beautifully. She writes this, On this platform of peace, we can create a language to translate ourselves to ourselves and to each other. To translate ourselves to ourselves. We feel more settled in ourselves, more available to others, more equipped to express compassion and empathy to others. This Christmas, we who are longing for peace, we who are experiencing sleepless nights of deep darkness, let us first step, let the first step be to consider some R-E-S-T. We who are longing for reconciliation or healing, 
clarity about our future and the way forward. We desire to see the world at peace. The Christmas message is rest. God is here. Gang's all here, all home, all held. So rest. What might that look like for you this season? It might look like a literal nap. Not kidding. Maybe this afternoon after the Seahawks win, if you have you know kids who don't nap, throw on a special Daniel Tiger holiday you know edition. Take a nap. Lie down. It might look like taking a winter walk and reflecting on those words, Come all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Where do you feel the burden in your story? Consider what it looks like that God has come near. That Jesus promises to lighten that burden. Ask for the grace to keep living into the presence of that burden lightening God. See, rest in a loving God's nearness brings us to a place where we are not only experiencing peace, but then we are actually let out into the world as people of peace. We heard read this morning some beautiful and poetic words spoken by that old priest, Zachariah, about the coming birth of Jesus. These words are from Luke chapter 1, and they bring us right to the brink of the Christmas story. Zachariah says this, Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. See, there's something essential to the life of faith that Zechariah reveals here. And if you, you know the story, you know that Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. This is a guy who was born right around the same time as Jesus. He's given the promise of a son very late in his life, and he has doubts about that. And because of his doubts, for the entire duration of his wife's pregnancy, Zechariah is unable to speak. Here's what happens when you cannot speak. You must rest. Rest from having all the answers. Rest from parenting. Rest from relationships. Rest from your work. Some of you I think you must be nice, right? But Zechariah comes out of this rest and he offers tremendous words of hope saying, in Jesus there's this light breaking into the world, and not only will you know peace, but once you know peace, this God will literally guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace will ripple out into the world through us. As we go about our days putting one foot in front of the other, we will not be led by a sense of urgent anxiety or fear or a need to prove the value of our existence, but by peace. There's this trust that my life is held and the world is held, and that despite the depth of the darkness, a movement towards light and justice and wholeness is happening. And so in that story, I can choose the path less traveled. I can choose the path of peace because of the security that peace has given me. This way is so difficult given the demands we live with, and yet throughout history, we see remarkable examples of people who somehow, against all odds, came to rest in the the love of God, that they were able to love in a way that was spacious and compassionate and courageous. Like Jesus, their presence moved the world towards peace. I think of people like Toni Morrison, right, the author, who during her lifetime was a committed activist for peace and for justice. She was also a person of a deep and profound faith in Jesus. I once watched her in an interview in which uh, the interviewer asked her, Something to the effect of, like, what do you attribute your success? And I thought her answer was so insightful. She said, I got where I am today for one reason, and one reason only. When I was a little girl, and I would walk into a room, my father's face would light up. See, there's a rest this woman knows because she's grounded in a love so solid, so unyielding and secure. That come what may in the world, she, she knows peace. And because of that, she was able to move through a hostile world as a black woman trying to affect change for the good in the 1950s. Right? It was not an easy path, and yet she remained strong, walking in the way of peace because she knew the security of a loving God. I think of her story, and it reminds me of Jesus himself when the high priest came to arrest him towards the end of his life. And Peter, one of his friends, in kind of this act of defense, 
draws a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the guys trying to arrest Jesus. I'm not a violent person per se, uh, but if you're reading the story, this particular part just feels really good, right? Like the bad guys kind of are getting what's coming to them. But notice what Jesus says to his defender. He says, put your sword back into place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then Jesus himself chooses another path, not the path of violence, but a path of peace that on the surface looks like weakness, looks like surrender, looks like losing, but actually is full of strength. It's a peace that runs deeper than circumstances, even some of the worst ones we can think of, like death on a cross. It's a peace that carries Jesus through death to life. It's a peace that makes flourishing available to others, even his disciples who desert him and his enemies who kill him. Peace, he says. See, friends, we're invited this Christmas to know the peace of God by resting in his love and nearness, and then we're invited to be people on that same path that he exemplified for us. How we engage that path will look different for each of us, perhaps <coughs> reaching out to a person or a family member from whom we've been ex uh, estranged. As we experience rest in God, we notice kind of a space that's opening in us that's more capable of compassion, albeit difficult, compassionate conversation. Maybe this Christmas, walking in the path of peace means sending monies to doctors on the front lines of war, people who are desperately trying to support innocent victims in that war. Maybe it looks like simply saying, this Christmas as we gather, I won't speak ill of people. I'll actually honor the belovedness in people, and in doing so, I'll walk in this different way, this path of peace. Maybe the path of peace looks like renewing a commitment you have to a cause that you know, promotes flourishing of folks that live right here in West Seattle, our community, who are experiencing this deep darkness. I feel like for me, and maybe you've experienced this sentiment before as well, it's hard to be a church, part of a church in the year 2023. By that I mean like the big C American church. So often it seems our legacy is not one of peace, but of division and power and just general yuckiness, right? But friends, these words from Luke, they give me so much hope. These words from Luke keep me coming back here to this church week after week. There's a light breaking into the world. We are held in that. The back door is slammed. And therefore, therefore, our feet can be guided in a different way forward. What an invitation. No matter our background or our upbringing or our fears or our weaknesses or our failures, we are swept into that story and invited to act as agents of peace. This week I read an article about, maybe some of you saw this in the news, the events of Bethlehem, the city where Jesus was born. Um, normally they have these huge festivals this time of year, parades and ceremonies and different things. Um, but all of that has been canceled this year due to the war and the conflict happening there. In the article I read quoted a Christian woman in Gaza, a Palestinian Christian, and she said, this was about kind of speaking to this reality, she said, our hearts are broken and we are full of fear and sadness. We are peaceful Christians and reject violence from both sides. Love, as Christ taught us, is the most effective weapon for peace. I was so moved by her expression of love. It's one thing to sit where we sit in sort of the relative comfort of West Seattle and to choose the path of peace expressed in love. It's another thing altogether to sit in the midst of war and say, love, not violence, is the path to peace. What's one step we can all take this Christmas in that direction, to be a people of peace? In just a moment, we're going to close the service by lighting our candles together. Um, if you don't have a candle, you can just kind of raise your hand. Hannah's walking around and she'll, she'll pass one out. Kids, we'd love for you to participate if you're grown up, if you're able as well. But we're going to uh, light these candles together. And as we partake in this tradition, we'll sort of pass the light, right? Uh, someone near you will light your candle. I've been instructed to tell you the unlit candle is supposed to turn itself upside down, which makes a lot of sense. Um, someone will light your candle. We'll pass the light around. And as your candle is lit, I would love for you to just take a moment Breathe deeply. 
reflect on your own story, no matter what relational baggage or questions or discomfort you carry this Christmas, you can rest in a God who comes near as the core expression of his love. Take a moment to receive that. And then as we watch the light spread around the room, consider the second question, what is one step of peace God may be guiding you towards this season? You don't have to act on it immediately, but take note. Consider, consider taking that step in the coming weeks or months. I want to end just by taking us back to the beginning of the Bible. In the very first chapter, we read a poem that is the creation narrative. And the poem tells the story of how God went about creating the world. It tells that story through the lens of seven days. And at the end of each day, God says this phrase. He says, and then there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Then he creates on the second day, and that little ditty ends with the same repetitive phrase. And there was evening, there was morning, the second day. Now, if we pay close attention, you realize this is kind of a funny way to talk about a day, right? For most of us, instead of beginning with the evening, we think of a day as beginning with the morning and ending at night, which unfortunately for all of us is like 4.30 right now. But you get it. The day ends when the sun goes down, but notice, friends, that in God's ordering of things, the day ends with the dawn. What a beautiful thought. The day ends when the light comes and spreads. The day ends when the deep darkness is no more. See, this is the promise of Christmas. We take steps as people of peace, and these steps are not vain. Light is coming. It's not over until the day is dawn. Light will have the final word. This is the good news for you. This is the good news for me and for all people this Christmas. May it be so. Let's pray with one another. You are a God who created the world, not with violence and heartbreak and disconnect in mind, but that you are a God who in love created the world and said light, light will have the final word. God, I pray that as we consider your nearness, you, God, who came into the world to be near to us, that we would receive that love this morning, that this Christmas very real to us. And in so receiving, we could just exhale. Find a bit of rest. And then may we go as your people of hope, people of peace in a world that sometimes just feels God like it's crawling towards the light. May we be people who embody your goodness, your love, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Crinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee and Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Thank you. 
Go in God's peace, friends, and have a Merry Christmas.